For college, I went to Full Sail University and got my entertainment business bachelor's degree. And one of the main classes that rubbed off on me while I was at Full Sail was contract law and negotiations. I've been told by criminal defense attorneys of mine in the past that I should have become a lawyer. And as a result, I end up reading a lot of my friends' entertainment industry contracts. Today, we're debuting a new series on the channel where I break down the common finer points of music industry contracts, explain what you're likely to see, what you should negotiate, negotiate for and what you should definitely look out for. Hopefully this series helps to cut down on the amount of artists who get screwed over by signing shitty paper that they didn't understand. Welcome to episode one of the fuckery files. Let's get into it. In part one of this installment of the Fuckery Files, we're going to go over management contracts. What a typical boilerplate management agreement from the record industry is going to look like, what each of the terms and clauses means, and what you should look out for and negotiate for if you ever find yourself being presented with a management opportunity. In this part one, we're gonna go over the different sections that are included in a typical management agreement, and we'll go in depth on like 30% of those segments. And then in part two, we'll cover everything else. A typical management agreement is broken down into these sections. Number one, you have the parties and the definitions. So who's signing this agreement? Why are they trying to enter into this agreement? Then you'll have a section that defines the engagement. So what is the artist engaging the manager for? And what is the manager getting in return for that responsibility? Then there will be a section outlining the term of the agreement, the initial period and any option periods. What what triggers those option periods, the requirements for the options. Then there will typically be a section that really goes in depth defining what the manager gets a percentage of and how it's calculated, how it's distributed, how it's accounted for, how they can audit your statements and books, things like that. That will typically include expense recoupment, carve out clauses for revenue you don't want touched. There's typically a section that requires you to get an accountant or a business manager and talks about how the manager can audit audit your books to make sure they're getting paid appropriately. There's gonna be a section for material breaches, what happens if some of the terms of the contract are violated. There's going to be a section about assigning your manager power of attorney. There's gonna be a section about whether or not you or your manager can assign the agreement to another party. There may be a key man clause, which we'll get into in part two of this episode or installment on management contracts. And then there's a bunch of boilerplate stuff, warrants and representations, notifications, procedure, state laws, standard jibber jabber. Now each of the sections that I just named has its own landmines waiting for you if you're not careful. So we're gonna go over each of them explicitly. But before we do that, I wanna talk a little bit about contract negotiation. What's important in any negotiation is that you maintain the ability to walk away at any time. If you don't have an alternative option, you can't actually negotiate. So you need to be able to walk away from the table. Number two, you need to negotiate negotiate in good faith. Everything needs to be about what's written down in the contract. So if someone promises you something or says that this can be accomplished later on down the line but won't be represented in the contract, don't accept that. Either you're accepting that it won't happen or you're getting it in the contract. There is no middle ground where it might happen. But negotiating in good faith means trying to figure out what the other party actually wants and why and using that established line of communication to communicate your needs, what you need protected. Oftentimes, if there's language in a contract that seems predatory, it's probably the case that the other party has a reason for including it that is usually about protecting them in some potential nightmare scenario. If you can figure out why they're including it and what they want to protect themselves from, you can often work with them to figure out another way to achieve that that doesn't limit your potential. That's not true for all contracts. Like a lot of the production agreements I've seen, a lot of the label deals that I've seen are just flat out predatory. But when it comes to managing management agreements, you have a lot more leeway to talk about what your needs and wants are and to figure out what the other party's needs and wants are. Oftentimes in a management contract negotiation, you can create variants of the agreement that have never been created before. So always negotiate in good faith. And if a term confuses you or it seems unfair, talk to the management team or the manager and understand why they're including it, what they're trying to protect and see if there's another solution. With that said, let's get into these terms in depth. 
Most contracts, not just management agreements, start off with the parties and definitions. So the parties who are signing the contract have to be named, that is the manager or the management team, and you, the artist or the band, and all of the individual members as well. If you're a band, or if you're a group, or just any artist that's more than one person, oftentimes in a management agreement, it is not clear at the outset when you start talking to the management whether they want to sign the band, the solo members of the band, and their solo career, or both. If you're a band, oftentimes it's both. And the reason for that is that the management company has to protect themselves in the eventuality that they put all this hard work into blowing up the band and then one of the members of the band takes off with a solo career and they're left out in the cold. If they're going to put the hard work into developing that opportunity for that solo career, then they want to reap the benefits as well. So if you're in a band or just a group or any more than one person musical outfit, you're going to potentially see the language individually and collectively known as. Depending on how the language ends up in this first part of the contract, you could end up signing an agreement that not only goes for your band, but the solo careers of every member as well. And you wanna catch this early on because it's gonna become the fulcrum upon which all your leverage in the negotiation lies. You have a lot more power in the negotiation to find fairer terms if you know that you're giving them the band plus all the solo careers. And if you can't reach tenable terms, you might want to extricate the solo careers of all the band members in order to reach something that's more fair and more temporary and less imprisoning. This agreement is entered into on this date by and between X manager and Y artist, whereas artist desires to engage manager in Z activities and services, and whereas manager desires to accept that engagement. Now, therefore, in consideration of the premises and mutual promises contained herein, and for other good and valuable consideration, the receipt and sufficiency of which is hereby acknowledged. The parties here too agree as follows. It's not worded exactly the same way in every management contract, but it pretty much always says that boilerplate text. And believe it or not, this is there for a reason. It sets up the good faith purpose of this contract. If you ever have to sue your management company over this contract and it goes before a judge, the judge is going to look at what the spirit of the agreement is. It's not just intangibles. It's actually like what what were these parties are trying to accomplish? Is it reasonable to anticipate that this party knew they were agreeing to this thing based on the spirit of the agreement? This is all taken into consideration if your contract ends up in the place where nobody wants it to end up, a court in front of a judge. For the most part, excluding some nightmare scenarios, American contract law is very fair because it considers the actual intention of both parties when they sign the agreement. The next section that you'll probably have in any management agreement is a definition of the actual engagement itself. So artist hereby engages manager to be its sole and exclusive representation in the fields of entertainment, entertainment media, TV, acting, books, farming, painting, politics, beauty products. You'll see a whole shitload of fields entered into this part of the contract. What areas are they representing you for, which has an impact on what revenue they can collect from. So if here it says, that they're representing you for acting and writing, that any book deals that you sign and any acting deals that you sign, they also get a cut of. You might not need a manager for all these fields and you'll want to start negotiating that early on. If they intend to sign you for all these different purposes, but you're not confident that they have the experience to represent you in say the film or TV industry. You're gonna wanna make that a point of negotiation early. And these different fields that they set out for collecting revenue from you will pop up later on when we talk about the actual compensation. So let's move forward. At the end of this specific part of this engagement section, they're going to say something to the effect of, artists shall immediately advise the manager of any activities related to the aforementioned fields. The manager has to know what you're up to. Then in the next section, it's going to say that the manager accepts this thing that you're asking of them and it's gonna use very, very light language, not gonna use a whole lot of text to say that they have some vague responsibilities to you to represent you in those fields. What I love about management agreements is this is one of the first places where it looks pretty lopsided. I mean, the artist part of this section of the contract is like a mile long. It's like entertainment, acting, books, children's toys. It's like huge, it's huge, all the different fields that they define that the manager's supposed to represent 
represent you for. And then it gets to the manager's portion of what they're doing for you. And it's like, we'll advise you. It's hilarious. It's very lopsided. But ultimately, it's very rare that the manager is going to send you the first iteration of the agreement. And it's going to include all these specific definitions for what the manager is going to do for you. You may want to negotiate for specific responsibilities. You're supposed to show up to meetings. If I ask, implement a request process and things like that. But ultimately, the only reason that you would enter into a contract like this is that you're sure the manager is going to make their 15 or 20% worth it. So you're generally just going to have to trust that they're going to do their job. And then it'll usually include some language about how the manager is not exclusive to you. So even though they're your exclusive manager in most cases, they can manage other acts. And obviously that makes sense, but I wish it wasn't so lopsided. Because it's like, if you need more than and one manager. Let's say you need a merchandise manager and a marketing manager and a tour manager. Like that would require that you're not exclusive to this management company or this manager. So you might want to negotiate for those exclusions from this rule. Then there will always, always, always be some text in the contract, usually around this area of the contract, where they state that they're not a licensed theatrical company under the state laws of New York, and they're not a licensed booking agent under the state laws of California. In order for the contract to be enforceable across all 50 states, it has to consider what are the state laws regarding certain management contracts in certain states? Ultimately, this is just protecting them from getting sued by you for them representing themselves as like a booking agent. And then if the whole band versus solo career thing is going to pop back up, this is another place it might pop back up. There may be a clause in here clarifying that your individual solo careers and your band, your group, is all locked up in this contract. Or it might clarify the opposite. It might say this does not include the solo career of individual members of this band. And if you want to negotiate for this contract to only be for the band and not for the solo careers, you're going to need them to put it here. Now that the parties have been defined, the spirit of the contract has been set forth, and the engagement, what you're actually hiring the manager to do, that they accept, the exclusivity of that arrangement. The next section will typically be involving the term of the agreement. How long does the agreement actually last for? The first two components components that you're going to want to think about in your term section of your management agreement is the initial period and the option periods. It's typical for the initial period of a management agreement to be anywhere from one year to four years. Obviously, four years is very pro-manager. They're getting a great deal out of that. And one year is very anti-manager. You're basically giving them 12 months to show and prove or they're out of there. If your goal with a management team or a manager is to get straight to a record deal, which I have no idea why you'd want to do that. But if so, you're going to want to look for an initial period of 12 to 18 months. This ensures that the management team has just enough time to get you into a proper negotiation with the label. And it's a very typical construct for a management agreement is like, get me to a label. I'll give you a little bit of time to do that. If you're looking to stay independent for your career, or if you're looking to build up some independent value before you go and negotiate with a label so you have more leverage, then you're going to want to look for more like a two to three year management agreement. And that's for the initial period, after which there will typically be anywhere from two to four option periods of one year. When it comes to requirements for the option period, you're typically going to see a salary amount. So like how much money should you have made during that initial period? If it's three years, they might say that you have to make $500,000 or they can't exercise their option. Or they'll say that if they get you a record deal with one of the big three major record labels, that that will also give them the ability to extend their option. Now, if you're looking at requirements, requirements that they have to meet in order to exercise their options for the term, you're going to want to think about it in the context of all the members of your band or group. So if it's just you as a solo artist, you don't need to do a whole lot of math, right? You just need to divide the amount by the amount of years in the initial period to figure out roughly how much money you'll be making per year. If you have an initial period of just 18 months and they're saying that they have to make you $200,000 in those 18 months, that's really good, right? That means you're making over $100,000 thousand dollars a year. But if there's four people in your band, you're not making much more than $25,000 a year, which then you shouldn't have to stay on with your management. Their goal is to get you out of that circumstance, not keep you in it for four years. So the initial term, the option 
periods and the requirements for those option periods to be exercised are super important negotiation points. And you're gonna go back and forth about the amount for the option period qualifications. And then the record deal thing. What you don't want is for them to be able to get you any record deal and that qualifies the option period. You want right of refusal on any deal that they prepare for you and negotiate for you. And if you don't want it, you don't want it. They shouldn't be able to sign you up for it just to exercise their options. At the same time, you might not want the record label stipulation to be an option for exercising those option periods. It depends on what your goals are. If you wanna get signed up to a record label, sure, that's great. But if you're signed to a record label, dead broke, and they still get to exercise exercise their option periods just in case you pop off, that's a bad situation to be in and you're gonna wanna protect yourself. And you can even express to the team like, hey, I don't want a scenario where I'm signed to a major record label, I'm not making any money, and you guys still get to keep me on management. Now, in some management agreements, they will include some language here in that initial description of the term that basically says that when you sign your record deal, the term of the record deal becomes the term of this agreement, typically referred to as because becoming co-terminus with this agreement. You need to negotiate that shit out. Bob Dylan has been signed to Columbia Records for 40 years. If he had a co-terminus stipulation to his management agreement, it means the management company that got him to that Columbia deal would still be with him. He couldn't fire them. You don't wanna be locked to the same management for 40 years just because you really like your record company. You want options. So definitely don't let your record deal be co-terminus with the management agreement, especially considering that a a record label deal is going to have mad album options, none of which are defined by a certain amount of time. So you're gonna have to deliver album after album after album, and if you're in an unfortunate circumstance and you don't like what's going on, that's gonna be a hell for you. So make the management agreement on its own merits. Don't let them link up to the record label deal. That's a bad scenario to be in. And the last thing that you'll probably see in the terms section of your management contract is a stipulation that requires the term to be extended anytime you release an album. Ultimately, if they helped you to develop an album, made sure you had those studio sessions, managed the deal for the album and everything like that, they don't want the contract to expire two months after the album comes out and they don't get to reap the rewards of that album. So if you release an album right near the expiration of your management agreement, it's typical that your management agreement will automatically extend another year, two years even. So just watch out for that and negotiate it down, make sure they explain it to you, and make sure that you understand when and where and why that would happen. Because it can be confusing and you want to understand it before you sign off on it. This video is already really long, I can tell by my time meter up here. So I'm going to end it here and in part two we're going to go over all the rest of the terms in a typical management agreement. If this video was helpful to you, if you liked it, please like the video and subscribe to the channel because we drop music business nuggets like this every single Single week and you don't want to miss part two of this video on management agreements. With that said, I've been Circa for Full Stack Creative and if you subscribe, I'll see you in that next video. Peace out.